uh, work through all that adversity, put in all that hard work and have it um, lead to enough, to high enough levels of mastery with our team that we can overcome our opponents there who also crave winning a, a gold medal like that. All right, I'm here with the one and only Karch Karai. Karch, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, glad to join. Right on. Uh, Karch, you are an amazing person, inspiring uh, player, coach. I'm just gonna read your bio here because it's kind of amazing. You played at UCLA, three-time national champion under legendary coach Al Skates, shout out to coach. Three-time Olympic gold medalist, the only player to win an Olympic gold medal in both indoor and beach. You rank number one all-time in pro beach tournaments with 148. You're a six-time AVP MVP, and you're the current head coach for the United States women's national volleyball team in your eighth year. You guys got a bronze medal at the 2016 Olympics and a, and a silver medal as an assistant coach in 2012. You have experience as a broadcaster for ESPN, commentator for NBC, uh, for the AVP and the Olympics, and you authored two books. One of them is right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I sat in the background before, right next to John Wooden. That's, that's right. Uh, I, that's a great company to be that near. <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, you're a husband, a father, a role model, an icon, and one of my heroes, Karch Kirai. Thank you oh. so much for being here, buddy. Oh, that's a very kind introduction. Thanks. <laughs> right now. So we're going to jump right into it. What does living an inspired life mean to you? I aspire to um, be good at the things that I um, put my time and effort into. Uh, it doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't even mean great, but it means good and getting better. And so I aspire to be uh, a good husband. My wife and I have been married over 33 years now. Uh, a good father, uh, a good son, brother, um, a good coach, a good teammate a good man, a good American. And so um, I can't be all of those things at once, but um, uh, I would, yeah, I get too confused trying to do, be good at those 10 things, but in whatever I'm pursuing at that instant, let's say we're at, uh, I'm at the office, and I'm trying to be a good teammate as head coach along with our assistants and the other members of our staff. Maybe we're planning practice, things like that, and ultimately being really good for our team because we aspire to do great things. You mentioned how we uh, won a bronze medal in Rio and a silver medal in London in 2012, and our USA women's team has great aspirations. And one of them that we haven't uh, reached yet is to stand on the top of the podium in the Olympic Games. So we're excited to have an extra 12 months to do that. But um, uh, as with Tokyo coming up in 2021, but uh, whatever has my attention at that instant, whether it's time with my wife being a husband or time at practice being a coach i'm trying to be good at my craft and more importantly trying to get better and be uh, being a learner and it certainly doesn't mean being perfect but it means trying to be better tomorrow next week uh, next month and constantly it's a never-ending pursuit of um mastery i love that carts i love that you know i watched uh or actually, I listened to the uh, podcast with Michael Gervais, the great Michael Gervais. Shout out to Mike. Uh, he's awesome. Um, and, and yeah, I just want to build on this quote that I, I wrote down from that. Be and I just want to have you build on it. Uh, you said the relentless pursuit of good or of better, not of perfection, not of great. Some really good things will happen if you relentlessly pursue better. You know, and I just love that. And if you could just expand on that a little bit um, in, in, in terms of how that keeps you inspired. 
once, uh, and I'll say it mostly for our players with the USA women's team, but, or, or any player who's reached a level like that, when you've played that long and gotten that good, you're playing at elite levels of the game, game uh, levels that very few have reached. Right. It becomes that much more difficult to then get better because you've already do done so much improvement. But while it's difficult, it's mandatory. It's critical. We, we have no choice. We ha if we want to accomplish these big, hairy things that we've set out, other people are working hard. Other people are trying to get better, too, in other gyms in other countries around the world. So it's not that they're not doing work, too, and the work that we do accrues to our benefit. But we have to make our work be more mindful, um, be more productive, be more efficient, so that the time that we spend together helps us get a little better and helps us get better at a faster rate. Than, um, than those around us. I guess an easy way to sum it up is something I heard from one of my favorite coaches uh, of all time that I got to play for, and he's now just a great man and a great mentor of mine, Marv Dunphy, and he just said, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Mm -hmm. And we have to be trying to get better uh, because we aspire to do things, to play this game better than this, the USA women have ever played it, and to go places the USA women have never gone before. So that has to be a relentless pursuit. I love that. And so let's talk about practice because that's, that's the work, right? So what does having an inspired practice mean to you? A big part of um, reaching special levels of performance is... Um, making your training count. So um, one easy definition for that is just practicing mindfully. Um, having uh, a focus when you're training at any given moment. Okay, I'm training, what am I getting better at? Lots of people go through training and go through practice and they listen to the coach and she says, or he says, all right, here's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to um, play this game and here's how we score it. And then they follow instructions and they play and they compete. Um, but if they don't put their mind to a specific thing to try to be getting better at, at least at certain parts of training, then we're wasting that time in a sense. We could be putting it to more use. So mindful practice is um, actually putting attention on what it is we're trying to get better at. Uh, and that can't be five or 10 things at a time. If we're trying to get better at five or 10 things at a time, we're getting better at nothing. But putting my attention on one or at most two specific things I'm trying to get a little better at and being open to feedback from my coaches about that, being clear with my coaches on what it is that we are focusing on to, for that particular player to get better at, and, and then also taking some time after training. Okay, how did I do at focusing on getting better at this aspect of my game? How did that work? What went best? What could I do a little better in reflecting on that practice, on trying to get better at that skill? So it's a process of planning, of action, of review, and doing that over and over to make those precious minutes in the gym count. I love that. And as a, a player and a coach myself, I know it's difficult to have an inspired practice all the time. So talk to me about an uninspired practice. I'm sure you've uh, <clears throat> been witness to some of those before. And what are those like? And what are some tools to get back to an inspired practice in that moment? Well, I think um, our, our players and a lot of us uh, in volleyball, especially us Americans, I mean, we, we love to compete. We love to keep score. Right. We play volleyball. We don't play volleyball 
to just play volleyball. We play volleyball to have a quality opponent across the net, to have the outcome in doubt, the result in doubt, to, to uh, add up the points and to try to add up, to have our score add up to more than theirs. Um, we don't just get into this to, to scrimmage without keeping score. Uh, so some of the practices I've seen that are uh, or heard about that are on the other end of the inspired scale would be ones where nobody has any clear idea of what we're trying to accomplish, what we're trying to get better at, either individually or as a team, and where we're not keeping, where we're not at any point in that training keeping score and doing some competition because ultimately that's what we, that's why we do this game. And so we need to be uh, both getting better, but also <clears throat> spending some parts of our training actually competing, which allows us to train and improve at competing. Um, so that would be an uninspired practice where nobody has any idea of what we're working on and why and what we're trying to get better at and we're not keeping any score and we just go until the clock strikes the top of the hour two two hours from now and practice is done. Right, right. Um, One of the ways to combat that, and we talk to our team a lot about this because our USA players are a really special group of women uh, who are should be great role models for kids, for young girls and boys all across the country in terms of how, what, what hard workers they are, how dedicated and uh, intelligent and um, powerful and um, sacrificing they are. But when they go, uh, uh, so when they spend time with us about half the year with the USA team, we try to organize practice in a more inspired, a more mindful way. In when they're overseas, they often don't have that. And so the best way to combat that is um, to have a buddy um, on the team, especially if that person can speak reasonable English so you can communicate. But uh, it, it's a really effective way to work in the buddy system. Even if the coach designs a practice with no apparent goals and no apparent focuses and, and there's no score kept, uh, if, if you and I, you, Aaron and I are buddies on a team, I can say, look, Aaron, I'm working on my transition footwork. When I come down from the block, I have to come down running and get off the net and get available as a hitter. So I just want to let you know, that's what I'm working on. And you'll tell me what you're working on. And then during a practice that doesn't have any apparent goals, once in a while, you could say, hey, Karch, uh, I just saw, w way to stay on your task, way to stay on your focus. I just saw you working really hard on your transition footwork. You came down from the block and you shot out like a, out of a cannon and you got off the net and you got available as a hitter. You didn't even get set, but you got available as, as a hitter. Or you could say, hey, you know, if you see me forgetting, you could say, Hey, Karch, what was your focus again for today's practice? And I could say it was transition footwork. And you could say, uh, can you remember what happened on that last play? And, and I'll think about it for a second. I'll say, oh, crap. I, for, I completely forgot. I just stood there after I blocked and I didn't do anything. So you can get me back on task and you can also give me props when I do it well. You can help me uh, get my mind where it needs to be. Um, and so you and I can help each other make it a much more mindful practice, even if the conditions are such that there's no apparent uh, aim or goal or mindfulness to the practice. That's okay. a, a great way. The buddy system is a great way. Uh, you don't always need a coach for that. In fact, it's important for players to be working together to help each other get better to it. A, a coach can't be watching every single action a player takes. And so that works even with coaches who are really good at making practices that are training sessions that are designed for the team with clear 
things to focus on to improve for individuals, for the team. It's still important for players to keep an eye out for each other. I love that. Uh, it's basically an accountability partner on the court. Yeah. And uh, that's really powerful. Um, talk to me about an inspired game you know, and, and, you know, how it feels. And, you know, again, when you're in the middle of a game and it just all of a sudden feels uninspired, what are some ways to get back to being inspired back to the moment? Well, I think um, when things are most fun in volleyball are when one plus one adds up to five or seven okay. or 10, meaning that when the players on the court, those six players and the players off the court who are waiting their turn to get in the game, which they may or may not get in that game, when all of those players are dedicated to making each other better, uh, one play at a time for a couple of hundred plays or however long it takes, that's when one plus one adds up to way more than two. And everybody's been on teams like that. And it's a really amazing feeling to, um, to have everybody dedicating to dedicated to making each other better not as opposed to um uh, feeling pity for themselves because they're not in the game or anger or frustration um or somebody's having uh, a rough game some part of their game's not working and so they immediately turn inward they get small and their concern over their understandable concern that they're not contributing the way they would like to. Maybe they're struggling with their offense, but they turn so inward and they forget that they can still make each make people around them better in other phases of the game in hitting, uh, sorry, in serving and passing and blocking and defense and other things. If it's an outside hitter. So um, trying to, Elevate the play of those around you is a really inspired, a really mindful way to play the game. Um, and we've also all been on teams where one plus one adds up to zero. Right. <laughs> things are just going wrong and people aren't doing that and aren't dedicated to making each other better. That's not a really fun team to, to be a part of. Everybody's been a part of teams like that. And and it actually kind of sucks the life out of you and it makes it so it's just volleyball's not as fun to go and train and compete. And then we've also been on teams where one plus one adds up to two or you've got really good parts and five plus five adds up to 10, but it's a lot more fun if we can make that add up to 15 or 20. So right. we still have to uh, be to aspire to uh, elevating the play of those around us. That's when volleyball is most powerful. And that's one of the great and powerful life lessons is it goes far beyond volleyball is making people around us better. Um, being easy to be around being a good teammate. Those are, uh, those are great things. If you want to have a great marriage, certainly one component to that would be being an easy partner to be around. If you're not easy to be around, that's a tougher partnership, whether it's marriage or um, being a teacher as part of a team of teachers at a school or any other endeavor in life. Finding ways to make people around you better is a much more mindful, rewarding, inspired way to go about it. I love it. I love that, Karch. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your mental performance kit. Uh, in a second for mindset, but I just wanted to, you know, because this whole project is about tools for the youth athlete and how to become an inspired athlete, not just on the court, but off the court as well. Uh, I, I would like to know from you, how does an inspired practice carry over to an inspired game? Well, once we get to the portions of the, uh, everything we do in training carries over because there's a cumulative effect. Everything we do has an impact on how our team is going to perform when we put a uniform on. But when you're talking just a, in terms of uh, the competition aspects of training and the competition aspects of a match, um, the 
the chances we get to compete in training, let's say we form two teams and we're doing some kind of competition. It could be just scrimmaging, as simple as scrimmaging in a game to 15 points or 25 points, or it could be any of um, a zillion other forms of competition. There's still the element of how do we do this together and make each other better. On the next play, how do we um, rehearse this idea of being totally focused on making each other better and maximizing our chances of winning the next point? And if we get pretty good at that, that's going to be a direct uh, skill that we can translate over to when we put a uniform on and there's a referee and a crowd and all of that. And, and, uh, we, and that's why we play volleyball is to actually put a uniform on and, and measure ourselves up and our team up against others. I, I really love that. Love that. Um, so, you know, I watched your uh, keynote speech at the Association of Applied for Applied Sports Psychology uh, last year. And you talked about your mental performance kit. Love to jump right into that right now. Talk about some mindset with you. Um, that was number one in your toolkit, the, the uh, work from a mental model. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and, and talk about, you know, what, it, what is your, your mindset going into uh, a practice and a game? What, what, just give us a little glimpse of that. Um, I'm going to pull up some of the parts here if yeah. I can. Sure. I'm looking at it just so that I make sure I'm covering the same things. I'm opening up my uh, PowerPoint here. Um, so there. Um, and, and while you open that up, I just want to say I'm going to leave a link to that speech uh, uh, on this on this talk as well, because that speech was very inspiring to me. It was awesome. And everyone should watch that. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, first, um, I do have, and this is certainly not something that I've invented. Lots of people have come before me who've uh, created various versions of a, of a kind of a mental model in mm -hmm. terms of how to approach an activity like competing in volleyball and lots of other activities that can involve uh, stress. When we compete, with a well-matched team across the net, there's gonna be some stress involved. Uh, uh, I guess you could say uh, anticipation, uh, butterflies in our stomach, things like that. Why is that? It's because we care a lot. And if we didn't care, we wouldn't have any of those things, but then it would be pointless or it, would be, it wouldn't have any meaning to us. So it's a good sign that there's some anxiety or anticipation. And uh, also there's stress or anxiety because when we play a well-matched team across the net, the outcome is in doubt. It's no, f when you think about it, yeah, I, I guess it might be fun to win every match, <laughs> but when you start thinking about the ramifications of that, um, they're not so fun. Like we could just play a team of third or fourth graders and we would beat them every time, but that would be no fun. The outcome's not in doubt, but the, the, uh, whereas one team is so overmatched by another team that it's not really any fun. So, um, I think it's important to be able to have some tools to, uh, deal with some of that stress or anxiety or anticipation. And one, one of them is uh, this, or, or this mental model starts with the idea that we don't get to control all the thoughts that pop into our head. If you and I, Aaron, right now, if I just said, all right, let's go silent for the next 20 second, seconds, and we are going to command ourselves to have not a single thought. We're just going to blank our mind for the next 20 seconds. Um, you and I would fail in that endeavor. We haven't sat, we haven't 
sat at the top of, the, of a mountain in the Himalayas for the last 20 years, honing that skill of blanking our mind. And if we did it, I'm sure we would each have three or four thoughts. Maybe one of them would be, why am I doing this? And then I'd think the next one might be, what are the people who are watching this, uh, <laughs> this cast think, thinking during this, this silence of 20 seconds? Um, and then it could go to another thought. Or I, uh, and so it's easy to have the thought, thoughts pop in our minds. The first thing is we have to be able to notice, whoa. I had a thought and in volleyball or in a competition of ev evenly matched teams, it's really easy to have less productive thoughts. I don't call them bad, uh, but I call them less productive. Let's say I'm going back to serve. Here's a less productive thought. Oh man, I hope I don't miss this serve. Or, or another less productive thought is please, God, have, help me get this serve in. Uh, but if I can just notice that, I can, and those pop up again, we don't have complete control over those thoughts. They, they are a part of everyone's mind and it's um, totally natural. But what we can do is notice, be aware. And I could say, whoa, I just had a really unproductive thought, a thought that said, please at least please don't serve under the net <laughs> in front of the world at an olympics and a, a more productive thought would be okay there's the 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 serving target over there i'm going to nail her on her left foot on her shoelaces or i'm going to blow you up that's a more productive thought than please don't miss so a we have to notice b we have to understand that they're totally normal. Everybody has these thoughts. Doesn't matter how good you are, especially when you're against well-matched competition. Um, it's natural that you will have thoughts like this. We all do. I had plenty of them. I still have them uh, as a coach, and I had plenty as a as a player. And then finally, uh, noticing and understanding they're normal. Then the third part is just getting myself to a better, a more productive thought. So it could be, whoa, I just had a really unproductive thought. All right, I'm gonna crush this next serve. I'm gonna attack that passer over in zone one. I'm gonna hit her in the space between her and the zone one, zone one sideline. So those are the main parts. Noticing, um, understanding that they're normal, everybody has them, and then redirecting myself to and and putting my mind onto uh, a more productive thought or focus. I really like that. And I like how you talk about what's the next task. I think that really helps an athlete just focus from that unproductive thought to the next thing that they have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And uh, one thing that stuck out for me too, is you, you talked about the story about having a meeting with yourself after I think it was an injury, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and then you went on a winning streak right after that. Could you just expand a little bit on that meeting with yourself? Because I feel like a lot of athletes, we all need to do that at some point, whether it's an injury, a loss, something happens and we just need to talk to ourselves about what we're doing. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I was at that time I was coming back from my first shoulder surgery and I was playing with Adam Johnson. That was uh, the season after Kent Steffes and I had won the Olympic Games, the first ever beach volleyball Olympics in Atlanta. And then I injured my shoulder. Just to, um, I had played a lot of volleyball and finally one of the rotator cuff muscles gave out. So I needed to have it repaired. And in the process of having it repaired, my shoulder architecture uh, was changed a little. They tighten things up when they fix your shoulder or they fix a muscle. They do other things besides just repairing the muscle. And I was really struggling with the new architecture in my shoulder. And I would take a swing that for um, 20 years plus um, had meant the ball would go there, three feet inside the line, two feet inside the end line. 
And now that same swing would go five feet beyond the unlined or four feet wide of the sideline. And my line swing was completely unpredictable and undependable. So um, as I was struggling through this, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to perform at a high level, not only for me, but for my partner. I felt like I was really letting my partner, Adam, down. We were having lots of lousy finishes. I think we finished 17th at one time. It was the worst finish he or I had ever taken, and we were a good team, certainly a better team than that. Uh, but it all fell down to my offense. And so tournament after tournament, we're struggling. And we finally lost out early in another tournament in Milwaukee. And um, I chose not to change my flight home because we had made so little in prize money <laughs> that I would have spent all the prize money on the change fee to take an earlier flight. And so I had an extra 12 hours to spend that day and just drove around and found another beach to sit at on a bench and just had a meeting with myself to come to terms with what was going on. And what I came to terms with was um, it looks like I'm not going to reach or return to the level that I uh, used to be able to play at. <clears throat> I, I'm, looks like I'm not gonna be able to play the Karch kind of volleyball that I had been used to playing uh, up until that age, which was um, in, in to being 36 years old. And um, I uh, reconciled with that. I, I, I came to peace with that and just thought, okay, if I'm not going to play that kind of volleyball anymore, I'm just going to do my best, finish out this season strong, be the best teammate I can be for my partner. Yep, we might have some other lousy finishes. Going to have to be okay with that. And then I'll probably, uh, uh, or almost certainly retire at the end of the season. Um, but it just gave me a little bit of a peace of mind. So we went into our next tournament and my play picked up. Uh, in fact, it picked up so much so that um, uh, we <laughs> surprised ourselves or I surprised myself and we won that tournament. And then we won the next tournament and we won the next tournament and we won the next tournament. And so we had a really strong finish to the season that I never would have expected, but just coming to grips with the possibility that I might not ever be able to play the game or something close to the game that I could, that I had been playing before that surgery uh, helped lower my stress levels, put less pressure on myself, and my play actually, uh, my performance uh, raised and instead of retiring at the end of that season, I ended up playing 10 more years. So um, uh, all because I was able to come to grips with what was happening, what I was struggling with. I love it. So inspiring. Uh, you're taking a, a quote unquote failure and you're turning it into a 10 more years and more success. Um, that's, that's, that's great. And just to stay on the self-talk for a second, uh, I want to ask you about self-talk during during the game. You know, <clears throat> watching you over the years, I noticed that in between plays, you would set up so quickly, especially as a blocker, go right up to the net and just, like, you, you were just like, the, you had this, like, stoic look on your face. You're looking at the other opponent. Um, want to know a little bit about what's going on in your mind during that, during that stoppage time? Um... Uh, I guess a couple of things. Yeah, sometimes um, teams would call timeouts and I would choose not to go to the player area or the bench and just stand there and wait until the timeout was done and um, be ready to go. So one thing was it was um, trying to get to the next play and start planning on what we can do to maximize our chances of winning that play. That is get my mind off what had come before mm. and move on to planning the next play. And another was, uh, it was a kind of a test of willpower for me. Um, sometimes when it's really hot and humid, we all want some shade. <laughs> and we want to sit down 
Um, but I wanted to make it a test for, for myself. Can I go without the shade? Can I go without sitting down? Can I be, uh, can I have strong enough willpower? Can I be tough enough to not do those things? And so I would challenge myself in that way. In fact, uh, indoors, I played for many years with the USA team, eight or nine years. I just made it a point. I never ever sat down in training. Like when we had a water break, I didn't go find a chair or a bench. I stood. Um, that was just a part of my operating system. But one of the benefits to doing that on the beach is if the other team is also feeling hot and tired, but they go over and they sit in the, uh, they sit down and they get some shade and they see somebody else not doing that. I think it just gives me a, a tiny mental advantage. Like, whoa, um, he must—you know—he he must be feeling stronger or fresher right now than we are. Even though in reality, I wasn't feeling any fresher or stronger than they. But I gave them the impression that I might have been. I, I might have had a little stronger willpower, but I was probably just as gassed and just as hot and just as um, fatigued as, as they were, but I was showing it less and that gave me an advantage. Right, and so you create these little challenges for yourself, right? Because yeah. <clears throat> I think you, you had discussed, you, you were playing in some like incredibly hot weather in Brazil one time and you just challenged yourself not to call a timeout before they did, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a match, I think, um, uh, Pat Powers and I, I didn't play with him very often in my career, but on a couple of rare occasions, we played down in uh, one of the earliest ever international tournaments, a precursor to the FIVB tour down in Brazil. And it was uh, the conditions we were playing in were the hottest and most, most humid I had ever played in. I think it was uh, 44 degrees centigrade, which I think translates to around... 112, 114 degrees Fahrenheit and 98% humidity. And so it was um, absolutely brutal and challenging. <laughs> and when, we, when a timeout was called, they gave us extra time. Like all four of us sometimes would go and just jump in the shower to try and cool off and go right back out completely wet because we were already completely wet <laughs> from the humidity or we would pour ice water over ourselves, whatever it took to try and cool down a little. But the challenge that I laid out for myself is, I knew that they were gonna serve me every time, Sinjin and Randy, so I would have to carry a big load on offense because I would have to pass and hit every time. And then uh, we chose to make it a challenge on Sinjin and serve him every time. And so it was really a contest of wills and and, Sinjin is one of the all-time great players, one of the greatest ever to play beach volleyball, um, and also one who had an amazing amount of willpower and of fortitude and of competitive fire. So it was a really fun competition in that sense. But I didn't tell him, but I just said to myself, I am not, I don't care how gassed I am, I'm not going to be the one to call the first time out. I want it, I want it to be them or him to be the person who has to almost like um, not wave the white flag a little, but just exhibit the first symptom of fatigue. I don't want to be the person, even though I am completely fried in this heat, I'm not going to be the one to call that time out. And so I didn't, I refused to, but boy, was I thankful when they did call that timeout because I wanted it called out just as much as anybody, anybody, any of the four of us. Uh, but I wasn't going to be the one to do it. That's that's awesome. I love the idea of making your making a challenge in the middle of a game. And uh, just one more thing on mindset before we move on. Uh, you you also talked about it one time where you were playing, I believe, internationally with the U.S. USA team indoors. And you were in the outside hitter position and your setter went down. And all of a sudden you had to be the setter in the middle of the game as lined up as, as in the outside hitter position. And I'm just, I'm just wondering if you could, you know, talk about that experience and what happened in your mind in that moment um, to help yourself and your team 
adapt to that new lineup? Well, it was a really important match um, the year after our first Olympics when we won in Los Angeles. It was a great accomplishment. We were really proud of it, but we also knew that there were there was a lot more because that first Olympics um, there was a boycott going on, and the and the number one ranked team in the world at that time we now call them Russia. At that time, we called them the Soviet Union they were not able to come and compete in Los Angeles. So we wanted a shot at the Russians in a major event. We didn't get it in the Los Angeles Olympics, but we could get it the next year at the World Cup. But first of all, we had to qualify for the World Cup. And there, was, there were other great teams in our zone who also wanted to qualify, and one of them was Cuba who just, uh, who also had been a part of the boycott and eight years previous had, I think, taken the bronze medal in, um, in the Olympics. They were a very high ranked team, really good. So we're playing the Cubans and we have to beat them. Only one of our two teams can actually go and compete in the World Cup. But early in the fourth game, we were up two games to one. Um, our setter, Jeff Stork, subbed himself out of the game. We couldn't figure out why, but then we realized later that he was extremely dehydrated and he basically couldn't even see the ball or or uh, perform at all. So he ended up having to get um, important medical care in the locker room with IV bags. But that left us with a screwed up lineup because I was in the outside position. So our coach Marv subbed in an outside hitter into the setter position and just said, all right, Karch, you've done some setting before. And I had done uh, quite a bit all through UCLA. And he said, Karch, um, you, you set, you guys figured out. So we just, that was something we had never practiced up to that point and never practiced since. But our team had a, a mentality of um, not really feeling, not feeling sorry for ourselves, but if something new, if something happens, something goes wrong, and it always does, <laughs> especially in competitions like the Olympics, World Cup, World Championships, something always goes wrong. And when it does, our team had developed a, a good mentality of, okay, this went wrong. Let's think of it more as a puzzle to be solved how, or, or a math problem to find a solution for. How, how do we find a solution to this? This is actually really fun. We've never done this before. What a, what a great thing to be able to look back 10, 20 years from now and say, yeah, remember when we didn't have our setter and our other setter, our great setter, Dusty Dvorak, at that time had stayed home because his, I think a relative had just passed away, but we, we approached it with a problem solving attitude rather than a let it pin us to the floor attitude. And we, it wasn't pretty um, because I wasn't a great setter, but we adapted and adjusted and uh, I wasn't tricky, just tried to give our great hitters something reasonable, reasonable to work with. And we ended up winning that game and that, uh, that uh, qualified us for the World Cup but that kind of puzzle solving attitude was huge and it got us the chance to then go play the Soviet Union in the World Cup, beat them in that, in the process of our first ever internet, major international title at which all the best teams participated. So it led to a tremendous accomplishment, but it started with a, an excitement about, yeah, we've never done this before, but wouldn't it be great if we figure out how to do this? And, uh, and everybody was in, all in on that. It was a, a great, uh, great example of our team coming together and rising to a challenge with this, almost like a curiosity and a, all right, how, how are we gonna get over this hurdle? I love that approach, Karch, that's awesome. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about emotion. What are the differences and similarities in emotion from both an inspired practice and an inspired game? Well, um, I think one of the beauties of volleyball is it's a quintessential team sport. Nobody can really dominate, even in the two-on-two -two version of the game, but especially in the six-on-six -six version of the game. 
Um, it's not like baseball where a pitcher can throw a no hitter and completely take over a game or even in basketball where a LeBron James or a Kobe or a Michael Jordan can utterly take over the game because they get to hold on to the ball. In volleyball, as soon as the ball comes to us, we have to give it away. So it's really one of the quintessential team sports. And I heard Mike Lambert describe this really well. Um, when our team makes a good play, there's a short-lived, oh, it's a fancy word for that, ephemeral. It's very short-lived. This, this, there's a spike in energy. The energy goes up. And we have a few seconds to try to harness that and turn it back into our group to help us for the next play. And so, um, but if, if somebody makes a great play on our team and we don't all take, um, make the effort to harness that energy, then we just lost a chance for us to um, build each other up as a team and make each other feel even stronger for the next play. So I think it's really important. We don't, I don't want to ride the highs and lows emotionally. Right. I, I don't want to, I never wanted to as a player and I never want to as a coach or for any team that I coach. I want, I don't want us all to act like we just won the gold medal when we win one play and that we lost a gold medal when we lose any play. But it is important for us to come together and celebrate the good plays of those around us. That's another part of making people better. So that's the, uh, the emotion that I look for is for somebody to, uh, let's say some hitter puts a ball away, then she points right over at the setter or at the passer and they give each other credit and immediately they're harnessing this otherwise short-lived energy to prop each other up and say, God, that was such a good play um, to a passer who handled a tough serve and even just made a pretty good pass and the setter made a pretty good set and then the hitter makes a nice play and gets a kill. Lots of people deserve credit and so we can harness our energy and our, our emotion that way. And uh, conversely, when things don't go well, um, it's really important for us not to get dragged down with that emotional energy. It's really easy. You see it with teams all the time. Something doesn't go well. Somebody makes a mistake and that person gets smaller. Their shoulders hunch over. Their chest caves in. Their chin goes down and their eyes go to the floor. They don't want to look their teammates in the eye because they feel bad like they've let, like she's let her teammates down. But all the studies, you know, the, I've seen lots of studies that say when I do that, I infect my teammates with that emotion within a few thousandths of a second. So it's really important not to infect my teammates with some of that sad or disappointed or frustrating, frustrated emotion, which I can easily do. So I have to um, hold myself tall, shoulders back. Uh, sternum out, chin up, and continuing to make eye contact. And that's how I can have an impact on my teammates, even when things went horribly wrong on any given play. But the faster that we can recover from that and move on to the next play and flush that last one, the, and, and the more consistently we can do that, uh, the better chance we're going to have to swing the match a tiny bit our way. And the margins are really thin between two evenly matched teams. But we have to figure out a way to um, harness the good emotion and flush the understandable, um, less productive emotions as quickly as possible and do it, do it as a group. Love that. Uh, I've heard you talk before about Karch bumps, <laughs> the uh, the feeling you get, and you get the goosebumps. Um, I get the I get goosebumps all the time when I'm in the inspired mindset, or I, I feel that emotion. I was wondering if you could expand on on what gives you the karch bumps. I think, 
And you just asking me that just gave them to me. I think that's uh, number three for, for today. Awesome. But a lot of it is, a huge amount of it stems or flows from gratitude. Um, I'm uh, incredibly uh, fortunate and lucky in my life in lots of ways. Um, and one of them is to get to be a part of the USA women's national volleyball team and to get to be a coach uh, of that because the players involved in this program are a really special group of people who aspire to do amazing things, historic things, never been done before things. And our staff, uh, we have a, an incredibly uh, skilled and capable and hardworking staff too. So just to get to be working around um, a high performing group of people like that who all are dedicated to um, increasing levels of mastery every day and accomplishing special things is something that I know I won't get in most other avenues in life. And so when I see an example of that, um, or I see a play, a player who's been working on something and then all the, and, and it's been a real struggle and all of a sudden she accomplishes it once, or maybe she does it three, two or three times in a row. That's just, hugely inspiring and makes me feel really grateful because I know how much work she's put into that. But uh, it's my belief and it's not my theory. Lots of other people have done a lot more thinking about this than I have. But um, I don't, uh, all of us uh, have parents or some, you know, all of us had parents as we were born. M the lucky ones of us um, still have both our parents around. Um, uh, many have lost theirs, but at some point it became clear for us that uh, any parent, one of their big hopes for their kids is to lead a happy life, uh, to have a life with joy and contentment and happiness in it, even though we can't be happy every minute of the day and we can't be content with every single um, every single thing that's going on. It's okay. It's, it's under, it's, it's okay to be dissatisfied with, I want to be a better pastor, but I can still lead a, uh, a happy life and present that to those around me. But I don't think we can lead a happy life, behave in a happy way. If we don't, uh, if we don't have any gratitude, uh, if instead we feel a lot of entitlement for all of the things that all of the, um, blessings that we have in our life. So hmm. um, that focusing on those blessings and my gratitude for them are the things that uh, more than anything else give me those kinds of goosebumps. <laughs> and, um, and I get them all the time because I'm, uh, I try to, I, I put work into um, noticing the things to be grateful for and remembering them. I love that coach. That's awesome. I got them right now. And one of the things that uh, we teach at West coast beach is, is gratitude. It's like the first lesson we teach. People ask me what we teach and I'm like, we teach kids how to be grateful for their opportunities. So that's really beautiful. It's one of the main tools uh, I think everyone can use, not just kids, but everyone can just be grateful for right here, right now. And, and then go from there. I love that. And I think we're getting some great lessons in it right now as um, so many people in our country and around the world have been in the midst of um, coronavirus and uh -huh. sheltering at home. And so the things we take for granted, like being able to go to work and work in teams and play volleyball, right? Um, all of a sudden have been taken away from us. And so, a lot of us are thinking right now, God, won't that be great when I can go to work, when I can be working with our other staff and coaches, when I can be coaching with our team, when we can have a practice where our team gets to do normal volleyball stuff. That's still a long way off, <coughs> but we're getting um, a great reminder about how that can get, that can be taken away, that can disappear. And these are things that are really cool and amazing to be a part of. And so we're being forced 
to remember um, how special some of these things are that, that maybe lots of us take for granted. So, but if we can, the key will be that when we do get back to normal, if we can still on a regular basis remind ourselves, yeah, remember when we couldn't play volleyball? I get to play volleyball today. <laughs> how cool is that? I just got goosebumps again. But if we can remind each other, this is a simple thing, playing volleyball. It's easy to take it for granted, but now it's not there. There's a zillion other things that are easy to take for granted. But if we can be uh, reminders for ourselves and reminders for each other, we'll, we can go getting goosebumps every day. Uh, and I just got them again. Yes. Uh, just somebody before we practice can say, yeah, remember when we couldn't do this? How cool is this? We get to play volleyball two on two or four on four or six on six we get to all touch the same ball and we don't have to uh wash ourselves down with purell after every play <laughs> and, or have masks on or whatever how amazing is this so we've got to be good at the collective memory and not forget this um it's easy to forget when it, when this goes away it'll be easy for a lot of people to go back to taking it for granted Absolutely. You know, during, since you mentioned that during this time, what I've tried to do is take, take this op take this time as an opportunity to reinvent myself. Uh, it's another reason why I'm doing this project because, uh, you know, <clears throat> I think you mentioned this before too, is just focus on what you can control. You can't control the outside world, but you can control the inside world and you can control how you are, you know, and who you are becoming, you know? And so, um, you know, again, the, the emotional part of that, because it, it is very emotional as you reinvent yourself. But the emotional part of that, to contain that emotion and to use it a, to your advantage is something that I'd like to teach the next generation. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let's talk about flow. Can you identify when you are in the game, in the flow, in the zone? Um, yes. I guess I would preface mm -hmm. it by um, uh, saying that... Uh, there are some different groups of people um, or maybe some different ways of thinking in terms of sports. And one way of thinking is that, um, that, and I believe there is this concept of flow, of being in this state where everything's just kind of happening. It's all going well for you. You don't have to think about anything the game seems to slow down feel like it's effortless or requires very little effort um, so that state exists uh, the question is do we spend most of our time uh, pursuing it chasing it or do we focus uh, on another task and I fall into the latter the second camp I don't think that um, it's time well spent chasing that flow state. The reason I say that, and I'm, I might, might be disappointing people who are following this broadcast, that's okay. But the reason I say it is because I played high level volleyball for 30 years from 15 or 16 years old until I was 46. And I can count I don't even need my toes. I can count the number of times where I had that flow state going and it was less than 10 times in a very long career playing on lots of amazing teams with some of the greatest players who've ever played the game. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of other high performing athletes on high performing teams and they would all say that that flow state that the times where I had everything in my game just flowing, just cruising along, every cylinder firing was very little, maybe 10 to 15% of the time. The vast majority of the time, you talk to major league pitchers who are some of the greatest ever. They'll say, yeah, I probably had all my stuff, my curveball, my fastball, my sinker, and my changeup all going at the same time and maybe one out of every 10 games. So I need to focus on, and they needed to focus on the other 85 to 90% of the time where we didn't have the flow state. It's my belief that 
the great ones don't often have that flow state, but they're, they're great because they compensate, they adapt and adjust, and they figure out what don't I have going today? What part of the game do I have going to? If I only have 60%, how am I gonna make the most of that 60%? and make my team better, even if I'm struggling that much. So it's, uh, to me, almost all of my career was spent in this period where one part of my game or another was not going. So I need to compensate and contribute in all the other ways that I can, and maybe figure out how to get that part of my game going a little, but like a pitcher, maybe someday, uh, she doesn't have her fastball going in softball or he didn't have his curveball going in curveball. Well, I just got to work around that. I can't uh, BMW. I can't bitch moan and whine about it. I got to figure out solutions and be good for my team. And so the vast majority of the time I didn't have flow state going and I didn't spend a lot of time um, pursuing it because it happened so rarely for me and I couldn't figure out in those rare times what caused it. So I, I spent all my time figuring out, all right, how to deal with the other 90% of the time. Interesting. That's, that's, a really, uh, that's a really interesting point about that because I always thought that you were in the flow state all the time, you know, and, and high performers, uh, high level performers like, like you. Um, and I guess that leads to my next question. Is it possible to practice the flow state? Uh, I did not find it possible to practice flow state. And like I said, uh, it was so fleeting and so um, rare for me that, uh, like, uh, like I said, I don't know what caused it to happen when it did happen. And, um, and so, um, like, I can think of a certain practice after I came back from having a broken finger in my hand and I had a lot of I was perky I had a lot of energy because I'd been sidelined for a while and so I went to uh, goof around with some jump spin serves which is not actually a serve I, I used much indoors but this one day it was just going and the harder I hit it the more it went in and the harder it was for passers on the other side but that's like one day out of thousands of practices that I had that going, or I had that going in a certain uh, one day tournament indoors in George Mason University outside of Virginia, Fairfax, for, or yeah, I think maybe Fairfax, somewhere in Virginia. And um, I can point to an indoor match or two, but all the other ones, uh, or many of the other ones, there was always some part of my game that I wanted better. Yeah, maybe they were all good, but uh, but to me and the standard that I was setting for myself, it wasn't enough. I was pursuing more, and so that's why I didn't didn't think of it as uh, as really of a flow thing. So again, I didn't pursue it at all. I spent my time figuring out how to compensate best and how to get the. If I have eighty percent today, how am I going to get? a hundred percent of that 80 percent and give that to my team wow <clears throat> that's awesome um let's let's move on let's talk about sources where do you get inspiration from karch oh i think we can find it from lots of places we have to start looking for it and if um if someone carries with them um a learning mentality then uh, that's a blessing to have too. And it, it, it really means that uh, with a little investigation, I can uncover lots of inspiring stories and information. It means that everybody I come into contact with uh, on a daily basis is better, way better than I am at something in their life. Maybe I didn't even know it, but they play the ukulele really well. Wow. And they've learned that. And I have something to learn from their ability to learn to play an instrument well. Maybe um, somebody I meet is, I don't know, when we get back to restaurants being open, I don't know if I'll have the time for it, but uh, it could be that so the person who brought us our meals, the server, 
happens to be an expert on, I don't know, uh, history 2000 years ago and ha I have something to learn from maybe there's some kind of history buff or the Civil War. I'm, that would be really interesting to learn from them on that. So I think there are always uh, people and situations where we can gain knowledge and inspiration if we approach it with a little more of a learner's mentality that we there's always some every but every single person around us is uh, has something to offer us in the way of knowledge and learning i love that i love that um you know just just building on sources of inspiration uh you've been coached by some of the best coaches in the world uh and now that you are a, a high level coach um what are some things that you can offer for a coach to inspire their players? Maybe the biggest thing is the same thing that's important for our players and our team, be a learner. Um, work to be a better coach next week than you are this week. Uh, part of that is being able to admit to your team when you tried something new and it didn't work because that's what learners do. You have to try stuff and stumble before you get better at it. And so being able to admit mistakes uh, is really comforting for a team because they understand they're in it with other human beings who also make mistakes and don't demand perfection. Um, so that's comforting in some ways. And to apologize for mistakes, if I've really screwed up in some way, um, uh, that too is powerful that we're all in it together. Um, uh, but again, to always be looking for inspiration in our coaching, things that I can learn from other coaches, from other situations, maybe other situations that have nothing to do with volleyball and training and teams, but still what are the, always looking for how can I take that situation? What can I take from that to make me a better coach with this situation? Uh, finding analogies and looking for uh, for the lessons so that's um, really powerful I think for for coaches is to be searching everywhere for the lessons that they can apply to to becoming a better coach I love it Karch that's awesome that's uh those are the main questions I have for you. I do want to respect your time. Um, can, can we just kind of fly through this lightning round uh, real quick or? Yeah, I got about five more minutes and then I'm going to have to jump off. So uh, let's try and crank it out. Let's crank it. All right. How do you define success and what does being successful mean to you? So sec success to me is um, setting out an aim of a constant pursuit of mastery and doing it on a consistent basis. Love it. How do you consider the idea of failure? Failure, and this is not my quote, but I've heard lots of others say it, failure is only feedback. It's information. Uh, if I fail, if I hit a ball out, if I get blocked or whatever, well, yeah, it didn't work. Um, it's some information. What can I learn from it? That's awesome. What are the most successful habits that you do on a consistent basis? A big habit is to try to go about the things that are important to me as a coach or were important to me as a player and go about them mindfully. What, what am I trying to get better at? What are we trying to accomplish here? And trying to keep my mind um, tuned onto that. Love it. What, uh, what is the most important lesson that has helped shape who you are today? I don't know that there's any single lesson for me, but um, there are a multitude of examples for anybody of how to foster a learner's mindset. Can you share the biggest challenge you've been through on your journey? Again, I've, uh, I'm not unique. Everybody has... Um, lots of challenges and adversity in whether they're a volleyball player, a volleyball coach, or just they're a human being because being human means that we um, we're fallible, 
we make mistakes, we screw up, we struggle to learn, we um, hurt the feelings of those around us. Um, there's, a, there's a zillion things that we can struggle with. And the most important thing is not that we have those struggles, but it's how we respond to them. The only thing, and that's what Viktor Frankl talked about in his great book, Man's Search for Meaning, but the only thing anybody, nobody can ever take away from us is our ability to respond. Our ability to choose how we'll adapt to what's happened to us, just like Right now, we have a choice in how to respond to um, all the circumstances around coronavirus. Love that. As a coach, what's the biggest challenge you see for your athletes? Um, I think the biggest a challenge for our athletes is, is the same thing. They, too, face amazing amounts of adversity, in, as any human being does, in their lives, in their volleyball pursuits. How do they respond to that adversity, to the challenge and to the setbacks? How important is the idea of having impact to you? Certainly I aspire to try to make people better around me. Uh, Bill Neville, one of my other favorite coaches used to say, uh, the great ones elevate those around them, elevate the play, elevate the performance of those around them. And that's, what I guess impact would mean to me. Karch, what is your ultimate why? Um, my ultimate why, um, especially as it relates to volleyball playing and coaching is this idea of I am all about an endless pursuit of mastery. And that's frustrating on the one hand, because it's never enough. Whatever we have accomplished is never enough. It's like pursuing um, a martial art. Once you get to be, a, you work your way up the belts and you get your first degree black, black belt, what's the first thing you do the next day? You start pursuing your second degree black belt. It's rewarding and frustrating and all of those things all at the same time. But uh, yeah, um, my ultimate why is this endless pursuit of mastery. I love it. Okay, last question, Karch. Uh, having achieved the peak of athletic achievement three times, what does fulfillment mean to you? Talk to me about winning gold. I, th I think uh, winning tournaments like that is a reflection. People um, get really excited when the Olympics come around, but the other three years, 11 months, and two weeks between Olympics, or in this case, four years because of the postponement of uh, the 20 of the Tokyo Olympics. But all the time between Olympics, um, the millions of people who follow the Olympics in our country, tens of millions, hundreds of millions who get excited about the Olympics, they're not following or aware of all the hard work and all of the frustration and all the adversity that people work through to get to that point of putting themselves to even be in a position to win an Olympic medal. And so while they're not aware of it, those who are in it are aware of it. And so that is a really fulfilling and special thing. And that's why I hope to be a, a part of that with the USA women to try to facilitate um, big hairy goals like that, um, winning an Olympic gold medal, something the USA women have yet to do, but we hope to do in uh, 2021 in Tokyo, is to put in, uh, work through all that adversity, put in all that hard work, and have it um, lead to enough, to high enough levels of mastery with our team that we can overcome our opponents there who also crave winning a, a gold medal like that. So that, that's great full fulfillment, uh, working through all that adversity and all of the challenge and all of the uh, getting through all the hard work to get to a point where a medal like that becomes possible. Karch, 
This has been amazing. I can't thank you enough for your time and for all the insights you shared with us today. Thanks for joining us on the Tools Within and uh, we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. Good luck to everybody and to you too. Thank you very much. This episode is brought to you by DAF Global. If you're looking to start a podcast or you have a podcast and you're looking for editing services, hit up my guys, Oliver and Garrett at DAF Global. They're awesome. They help me with this podcast and they take care of all kinds of different services like editing and audio enhancement. And they're great to work with. They're also offering a 10% discount to all within the game listeners. So hit my guys up at DAF Global on Instagram and also on their website, www.dafglobal.co.uk.